Okay, uh, it's about time to reconvene for our last session. Um, it's good to see there are still some people here. Um, I have um, just some reflections on 20 years of being at Olin, and I have had almost no time to prepare it. It's been a busy uh, last couple of weeks, as you might guess. A few things that were not planned have come up. Um, and I'm standing between you and food, which is always a bad thing to do. So I'll try to uh, go through this as quickly as I can to make it as painless as I can for people in the audience. What I'm gonna talk about is three things, okay? Sort of three phases of what's happened from my seat at Olin. The first one is starting things from a blank sheet. This has been recognized as the way you correct the problems in the traditional universities that don't change. It's easy. Let's just start from a blank sheet. Well, let's have a talk about that. Okay, what can go wrong with starting with a blank sheet? Turns out we've been visited by hundreds of universities, two of them in the last two weeks, who want to start new universities, one in England and one in Brazil. And they're convinced that starting with a blank sheet will just make all the problems go away. The second is about observations on global education and change. What's happening around the world? Um, it's not just the US, it's not just Olin. There are some important things happening that will affect Olin as well. And the third one is a vision for the future. What, what needs to happen and who's gonna do it? So um, let me start out with starting from a blank sheet. So first of all, I have to respond at least a little to Larry in his comments, which I felt were over generous. Um, he painted this picture that it wasn't long after I showed up that everybody was convinced they had the right decision and you know I was just the right person. I have a slightly different recollection of that. <laughs> it was a little more of a struggle. I understand how fortunate I was to be selected. Um, it was a long time ago. I was in my 40s. Um, I had not built any colleges that I could remember. Um, there were, I had not worked with the Board of Trustees. Um, Larry and the Board taught me a great deal in those first couple of years, and, their, and there's their great patience and persistence which allowed me to succeed, and I'm going to talk about that. Um, it's something my dad taught me long ago, um, and that's, um, it's always better to be lucky than smart, and being in the right place at the right time um, is exactly why I'm here, okay? The other thing that I learned about starting new institutions, it's all about people. It's really not about buildings and endowments and curricula. You need those. They don't matter if you have the wrong people. If you have the right people, those don't matter so much. It's about getting the right people. And if you're the first one, the only way you do that is to make sure that every person you hire is better than you are. And since I'm the first person, you know what that means. Um, so that was been a really important principle. The bottom line is gratitude, authentic gratitude, is the foundation for enduring success. And I've seen that everywhere. People who don't have enduring gratitude um, don't often last. And when you're looking at candidates for the next president, if there isn't some theme of being grateful about what happened in their career as they came up, I would be a little worried. Next, um, leadership. Learned a lot about leadership here. He's not be, never been to uh, Babson. I didn't take a course at Harvard in how to be a leader. Um, I just you know, jumped in the deep end and started moving my arms. Um, so what did I figure out? Leadership is not about power. Leadership is about responsibility. And that's another filter I would be using as I'm looking at candidates. If you think that the person is anxious to do this because they're anxious to have the power and the authority to make things happen, good luck with that, okay? Leaders who really succeed are those who take responsibility for what happens and are more nervous about the responsibility and what it means because they're the one who's responsible for everyone else. Um, Olin's mission to start from a blank sheet and to reinvent engineering education doesn't happen once in a lifetime. 
it happens much less frequently than that. This is a huge responsibility. And in fact, as I looked at it, um, this is way too big of a responsibility for any one person to imagine that they could sit down and invent the right answers and put them on the wall and everybody should look at it. This is way bigger than that. So for me, the answer was the President's Council. It's the group that's here now. This has lasted for a long time. So the first thing that I did was reach out to the smartest people I know and ask them to help me. Turns out it's not that hard to do. If you go to people, really smart people, and say, I have this bizarre opportunity to start with a blank sheet to rethink engineering education, and we have money enough to build buildings and to bring students here. Um, if you could change one or two things about engineering, what would it be? You know, I have not found a person who doesn't have an opinion on that. And all I need to say was, we need your help. Come and join us. We're meeting twice a year. We're going to ask you questions, and, you, and your opinion matters. And you can build a president's council. But it's about advice, because it's too much. It's ridiculous to think that one person is going to have all the wisdom you need to make it work. So the process, actually, is if you could start a school anywhere, and you needed, um, with high expectations, to be successful coming right out of the starting gate. It's about people. So where do you put it? You put it where the people are, OK? If Olin were located in Siberia, by the way, I was on a panel for um, the World Bank helping them to advise Kazakhstan on where they should build their world-class university. It's pretty close to Siberia, it turns out. Um, attracting the right people is a really important thing. By the way, Boston, this Boston, greater Boston community, is in essence the um, Silicon Valley of higher ed. The people you want are here. Um, many of them are in this auditorium. So um, that's a really important thing. And the process actually works like this. You start with a compelling need. Um, these, the people you want are not looking for a job. Um, they might need a mission, they might need a cause, something that's worthy of the rest of their life. So if you can articulate a cause that's worthy of someone changing their career at Harvard, um, then you have a chance to attract the right people. It starts with a compelling need. The compelling need attracts the right people, the right people develop the right ideas, with the right culture and process, those ideas with experimentation become how to do it, in, in um, policies and procedures, and it works in that order. If you get them backwards, things don't work so well. By the way, just in case bureaucracy is a really bad idea, okay? That starts with the how to do it that you borrowed from traditional institutions, and then you're trying to apply it to the blank sheet that's trying to do things in a new way. I understand how that works. In fact, I can give you lots of examples. I'll just mention one. When I was in Iowa City, Iowa, is the Dean of Engineering at the University of Iowa. My next door neighbor, uh, Julius Schmidt, was, a, was an uh, artist. In fact, he was a sculptor, and he worked in the art school. And I was complaining to him that the operations manual, manual at the University of Iowa had a risk management chapter that said, once upon a time, a student in the engineering school went to the shop, and they turned on the milling machine, and they got hurt. So the Board of Regents said, that shall never happen again at the University of Iowa. And they put a lock on the door. And only licensed machinists who are members of the union can ever touch the shop. And I said, I don't know how I'm going to get kids to really learn how to be engineers now. And he said, really? That's really strange. Because in the art school, we have kids that are smelting metal at 3,000 degrees. And there's no safety requirements whatsoever. They don't have, know anything about metal. It just works. Um, so when we came to Olin, we don't have a rule that says students can't work in the shop. Okay, now we haven't had an accident yet, so that might change. We'll see. Just in case bureaucracy, be careful of that. Um, as I said before, it's not about one person's idea. So when I was recruited to Olin and went to Larry's place, and we talked about this for a long time, I was so impressed with what he had to say not expecting really to be seriously interested in this, but Larry changed my mind. On the plane on the way home, I wrote a letter, uh, like five pages, I think, 
If you're really gonna spend that much money to start over, here's some things you should think about. We called it the white paper, okay? Um, Larry liked it. I think he then asked other candidates to do something similar. When I was recruited, it became the, the shared vision for what Olin could be. My first job, recruit like five, bres five vice presidents and get them here you know, before Christmas. Uh, this was the idea. Okay, what about the curriculum? Maybe what I should do is to take this white paper and put it on the bulletin board and tell everybody when they come, that's what we're gonna do. See, we've all agreed on it. I think this is a good idea, so does the board chair. And then I had this knot in my stomach. There's something wrong with that. Remember that point about no one person is smart enough to know exactly what to do? So I put it in a drawer and I didn't show it to anybody. Sometimes I threatened to show that to some people, but I asked our team to invent better ideas than that. And then they will own it as well. It'll be their vision, not my vision. The people that you want in a school that does this kind of innovation don't take orders very well. If they do, they're the wrong people, okay? So that started our culture off in a particular direction which led to experimentation. Olin's fundamental advice to everyone that comes is experiment. Try it. You know, it's is not hard. Again, um, I came from a farm, so none of my family are engineers. Um, and so I have some pretty basic ideas. One of those ideas, which is really simple, is it's amazing what you can see by looking. Okay, this is one, from one of our great philosophers who was a baseball player, right, Yogi Berra. Um, if you actually try it, if you pull the wings off of higher ed in a lab and see what happens, you'll be amazed at what you see. And I don't think Olin would have succeeded at developing the culture we have any other way than by what happened with the, the uh, Olin partner year. Because the experiments that we did and the results that we saw were completely non-intuitive. Everyone said this couldn't happen, and it kept happening. If we had read it in a paper at a conference, we'd have said, yeah, something wrong with that experiment. Nobody could duplicate it. But because we did it over and over and over for the same year with the kids we knew, we had to admit there's another way, okay? There's something better that could be done than what we're doing now. So I guess we don't have a choice, but we have to step out on the ice and try to make this work. Experiment, experiment, experiment. Then there's later on, watching the kids walk across the stage at commencement, several years in a row, became clear that there's something different about this, these graduates. This is not my first university, this is my fourth one. I've watched them graduate at the University of California, I've watched them graduate at USC in Los Angeles, I watched them graduate in the Big Ten at the University of Iowa, lots and lots of them. These kids were different. And then I talked to the parents. And what I realized is they have had here what I would call a life transformative education. You can't really see it unless you're a parent. But the kids who came in in first year are different than the kids who left. And I don't mean just because they know how to integrate by parts now in the calculus. They're different people. Their identity has changed. They came in, as some parents said, relatively fragile, but they left with a mission. A mission that the parents felt was protective. They didn't have to worry about them now in the world. Um, these kids were gonna be on the TED stage telling everyone else how to run the world. What a gift. How important is that? So, if that's what we do, it's transformative education, the question which is, I would say, every 30 seconds in the boardroom for 20 years, how do you scale this, okay? Do you write a book? Do you create a video? Um, do you like, replicate the college, a bunch of the little Olins all over the world? Do we create little toolkits that we send out, Olin in a box? How do you do this? This is about replication and growth, right? I've had a lot of time to worry about that because I can never satisfy the board in that area. I don't think my successor will either. Um, why does it not work that way? Every time I talk to the faculty about writing a book that will change the world, and some of us have, writing a book is not a bad idea, but it doesn't change the world. Um, why does it not work? 
I think what's wrong with education is more like what's wrong with a broken marriage. It's not because we miss a toolkit. It's not because we need to watch a video to get the how to do it. It's deeper than that. It's relational. It's identity. There isn't a quick fix, okay? I'm sorry, at least I haven't found it. It's like curing cancer. Um, you have to do this um, in a way that matters, in a way that works. We're still working on it. The best I can say about a way that changes is how Olin has changed the reputation and the vision for engineering in, around the world. Isn't it amazing? When I came here 20 years ago and sat in a, in a closet, basically, in Nichols Hall at Babson, um, we rented an email server at the University of Iowa because I knew the IT guy really well there, Doug Eltoft, a great friend. We paid him $1,000 a month and they ran all of the email for Olin, okay, through them. Um, my biggest job was telling people that Olin existed, number one, and then those people said, oh, Olin. It's like, Oberlin? No, no, it's Olin. And then, well, wait a minute, isn't there an Olin at Babson? Oh, I get it, you're the engineering school at Babson, because there's an Olin, Olin School of Business at Babson, right? No, it's not Babson. So for at least five years, the job was trying to get on the radar that we exist, we're a college, we're not like an independent college, we're not part of a university somewhere, we're trying to do this experiment, and it's so on and so on. A lot of that kind of work. And now, 20 years later, we have Ruth Graham telling us that everybody is looking at Olin as a model. So how did that happen? If we, if we set out on day one to do that, what did we do? I think the answer is given to us by Buckminster Fuller. Buckminster Fuller was an architect. He's the guy who invented the geodesic dome. What did he say? Fuller said this, to create fundamental change, don't bother trying to explain why it's needed, just make a new model that makes the others obsolete. Okay, and that's what Olin did. We haven't spent a nickel on marketing Olin to people around the world. They found us and they showed up. And now MIT is involved in the NEAT program, which Ed Crawley in this very auditorium said a little over a year ago, they're Olinizing the MIT curriculum. Okay, we could not have engineered that by selling a book, or by writing a video. We had to build a model that you can't get away from by looking at it, it works. Okay, and by the way, when Olin affects change, they don't copy what we do. Copying what we do, except for the experimentation idea, is not the right approach. I'm not sure Olin, what Olin does is the right thing. We talk about this a lot. The average kid at Olin completes 25 to 35 design build projects. Many of them have start and run a business. We have this candidates weekend thing where they all go through two days of you know, building stuff in the auditorium before they get invented. Now, talk to the University of Michigan about that. You wanna be like Olin? Gotta do this. No, you don't. Um, I think we overdo it because we can. Um, it's the culture. Do you really need 25 to 35 design build projects? I don't think so. I think Ed Crawley probably has it close to right at MIT. Their plan is to do about five, okay? That's 20% of the investment in their curricular change. I'm gonna bet they'll get 80% of the benefit, okay? It's a, I can't prove it. I think that's the calculation they're making too. It's adapt the Olin principles, it's not duplicate. And that's all you need to change the way people think. One last thing about starting from a blank sheet is about governance. Um, Olin would not be where it is if we haven't had a governance board that has been more than tolerant in the last uh, 20 years. Gover I've seen a lot of this. I've been on the board for another several colleges, not just Babson. I'm on the board now for Indian Institute of Technology in Gandhi Nagar. Um, I've been on the board for uh, Kustar, the Khalifa University of Science, Technology, and Research in Abu Dhabi, um, dozens, in fact, 15 countries, more than 100 keynote speeches. Um, there's two universities just in the last few weeks that are asking for the same thing. So I've watched governance around the country. The key to this, to harness the real creativity and the experimentation in higher ed is the faculty. And it's not rocket science, but people don't do it very well. There's a book by Henry Rozofsky. I don't know if you know who Henry is. 
He was dean of faculty at Harvard for about a zillion years. I think he was president for a while. Uh, and he's written a book about the operation manual for a university. How does it work? The key he points out, if you look at the Times Higher Education ranking of universities globally, you'll find that of the top 25, three quarters of them are in the US or in the UK. If you look at the top 100, it's about three quarters as well. So what is this? Is it because America is wealthy or, you know, actually, no. In his view, it's quite simple. It's about governance that recognizes academic freedom and shared governance with the faculty. This doesn't happen in other countries, okay? I can tell you, I was working with uh, the World Bank to advise Nazarbayev, uh, the, the president of Kazakhstan, about building a new university there in Astana. You know what their board of trustees is? At least as it was when they started? 30 people. Do you know who the chairman of the board is? Nazarbayev, okay? Um, the other 29 are ministers in the government that report to Nazarbayev. Um, nobody from the academic world. I was asked to be the first trustee from not in that group. And my wife was not fond of the idea of me flying to Kazakhstan every few months. Uh, we didn't do that. Academic freedom means you can't predict what the faculty will do. You can't predict the outcome of an experiment before you do it, else it's not an experiment, okay? It's a development project. Um, that's the real fuel that's allowed our faculty to move forward. So I'm hoping everybody realizes that it's really inconvenient in the boardroom if you can't tell you what the, what the achievements are gonna be in a couple of months or three years or what the budget will be. I know it's inconvenient, live with it. If you don't, you, you can be, predict everything. You can predict that nothing will happen here that's of any interest. So it's a trade-off. Um, innovation really begins by learning to improvise and by doing experiment. Really, really important lesson, both for the board and for the president. If you're going to create this culture that enables experimentation, there has to be a really strong belief, commitment, and understanding that underlying all of this is a kind of kindness, a kind of automatic forgiveness for not meeting expectations. One of our new faculty members explained this in a very brilliant letter to our Board of Trustees last fall, about this time. The idea is forgiveness enables experimentation. Obsession with failure or cost prevents experimentation. Okay, if I'm gonna get punished for trying new stuff, great. I can make sure I just keep my head out of that space and you will get exactly what you asked for. Predictability, okay? Which is what happens in all the other universities where I've been. By the way, all of this has enabled the ability to, for the board to be patient and to indulge a president who's doing a tap dance when he's trying to tell you what we're gonna be doing three years from now, because he has to keep looking in the faculty room to see what they're doing so we can predict that, um, is trust. You have to have an enormous amount of trust between the president and the board chair. You should not be able to put a knife blade between the president and the board chair on any important decision that happens in the college. If you can, you're on the way down. It's only a matter of time. How do you get trust? By the way, trust, like respect, is not something you can give. It's something you have to earn. Both ways. The president has to earn the trust of the board, and the board has to earn the trust of the president or you wind up protecting yourself. And when that happens, you can put a lot more than a knife blade between people. So trust is fundamental. What makes Olin work in the culture, everybody here knows, is teamwork. By the way, the, the, the foundation for teamwork is very simple. It's a rule that we call no surprises. If you're on the team, you don't find out what we're gonna do by reading it in the newspaper three weeks later. Oh, that's what they're gonna do. Apparently, I'm not on the team because they didn't even talk to me about it. Think about it. Even at a place as small as Olin, you have like 150 employees, teamwork with no surprises means it takes time to reach a decision. You can't just say, well, I'll answer you by 4 o'clock this afternoon if you're going to have to con consult with 150 people. Um, so get used to the fact that the pace of decision making in a team-driven environment is slower than the pace of, of decision-making in a top-down autocratic institution 
which may be what people are more used to. And of course, Olin is an institution on steroids when it comes to teamwork, so we really have trouble with doing things quickly. Last thing, which I think is very simple about the starting from a blank sheet thing, is um, really, again, I said I'm from a farm, right? So most of what, what I know you can put on a fortune cookie. Um, this thing says, simply, you can only teach what you know, and you can only govern what you've experienced. So if you're a teacher here, and you're supposed to teach teamwork, and you're supposed to teach people how to engineer, good luck with that if you never engineered anything and you never worked on a team. If you're constantly going back to the recipe book and saying, well, I have to spend so many minutes saying that, but you've never actually experienced it, it's obvious to the people who are in the class. You need to experience it. And if you're on the governance board for a college, particularly one that does a lot of experimentation, it's going to mean that you need to have experienced some of this, and you need to be patient if you haven't. Um, it's very hard to find people who've been through Olin who are ready to be a trustee, so you have to borrow principles and ideas from your experience elsewhere. Okay, so starting from a blank sheet works. Olin is an example. It also has a lot of pitfalls. A lot of things can go wrong. Most startup businesses fail. That's pretty obvious. Most startup businesses fail too. Olin is very fortunate. I couldn't be more grateful for the indulgence and the trust and the support that we've had from the board and from everybody in this room. Olin is an exception, and I'm absolutely thrilled. Now, observations about what's happening elsewhere. I've been a lot of places, it turns out, as you mentioned. The board has also asked good questions about that. Why are you getting on a plane going to X and Y? Um, so just a, an example of the places that I've been that I can just remember off the top of my head, give, in every case, giving a talk or being on a board. Uh, India, Brazil, Abu Dhabi, England, or the UK, Singapore, China, South Korea, Netherlands, Saudi Arabia, Kazakhstan, Russia, Mexico, Denmark, Colombia, Costa Rica, and I'm sure there are others I just don't remember. But you can't do this without learning something. Let me just give you one illustration. In April, for the first time, I went to Denmark, never been there. Usually, by the way, when we have really cool places to go, I give that to somebody else on the team because that's kind of, they can bring their wife, it's a good place, so that nobody wants to go to Kazakhstan. But this time, I went to Denmark, all right? Had, it was like ridiculous. I think I said the Guinness Book of World Records because I was back on the ground in Boston in 24 hours. So you had to go there, and it was 100 miles from Copenhagen, and then get back, and then fly, and then I had to be at Harvard the next day. The thing that sticks in my mind, this was a meeting of 250 people that were all ministers of higher education and science in, in the country of Denmark. And it was convened by the cabinet minister for higher education and science. Um, his name is Tommy Ehlers, and he's, a, he's an entrepreneur. So I'm the first thing on the agenda because I have to catch a plane. But we didn't start with any speeches. I stood on the stage, and you know what they did? They had a piano there and they all sang a song. Everybody sang this song. It lasted for at least five minutes. Well, Chris is in Danish, what are they saying? So I asked the woman next to me, you know, what are the words of this song? And why are you doing this? And she says, this is Denmark. We all do this. Denmark has the highest percentage of daycare um, for people independently of the family resources. They all send their kids to daycare of any place in the country. And we all learned these songs when we were little kids. So I got the words of this song. Um, it just says so much about the culture. Yeah, I don't remember the words exactly, but they start off with a verse that says, look at this person walking down the street, looking at their shoes, looking de depressed and happy. And then it goes into the chorus. Look at the sky. You know, imagine the horizon how the world could be differently if we just spent more time helping each other. Then there's the next verse, and it just goes through this all about how the world could be better if we work as a group. And you know what I thought at that time? Can you imagine if the US Congress started with singing a song? <laughs> <laughs> Look at what they achieve in Denmark. OK, if you do that for 15 countries, you begin to get some feeling for what education plays in this society and how it matters. And you know, I've done a lot of work with the Grand Challenges and with the National Academy of Engineering's Grand Challenge Scholars Program. There are four major areas. 
Uh, like, for example, sustainability. I mean, it's a word that's pretty common at Olin. It's not the only one, though, folks. There's also security, which is an issue, global health, and enhancing life in an age of, of increasing population on a fixed planet. But you know what? The underlying, the, what I would call the mother of all grand challenges, is education. Why? You can't do any of, you can't solve any of those other challenges without education, and educating in a new way, because it's a different kind of problem than we've attacked before. And secondly, education is the answer to a lot of the problems. For example, from the World Bank, the birth rate in Brazil in 1960, live births per woman is about 7.0. The birth rate in Brazil in about 2010, about two births per woman. Whoa, what happened there? According to the studies the World Bank gave, education for women has a transformative effect on birth rates in societies. So rather than building a widget for our iPhone and giving it to everybody so that they can you know, reduce the percentage of, of um, carbon that they're putting in the atmosphere today, why don't we talk about educating the young women in society everywhere? And that might, in fact, reduce the pressure on the grand challenges from the beginning. That's an interesting um, outcome that we don't talk about in engineering very much, because we make, we make things happen by building stuff. Um, by the way, if you look at the World Bank's view of what's happening globally in education, they point out that the BRIC countries, you know, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, have a rising middle class for the first time. What's the most important need of the rising middle class? Turns out it's education for their children. In all of those countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, there's a mad commitment to building universities faster than you can imagine. It's just ridiculous. In India, for example, in the last five years, they built about 3,000 engineering schools. Now think about that. What does it take to make a college or a university? Does it take buildings? takes people. I guess there were gazillions of PhDs in engineering working at Starbucks, just waiting for these colleges to start, right? So they could have a place to work. Um, it's people, okay? They're having a real problem with that. Um, Russia, there's Putin's 5-100-2020 project. This is how, how the new um, Skoltech at uh, MIT has been involved in, how it came into being, because of Putin's concern about that. There's um, China you know, which is building so many universities, about a UCLA-sized university every 90 days. They've been doing this for decades. There's 10 of them under construction in, in the Shenzhen, Dongguan area right now, because I just saw them when I was there in December. Lots is happening. But you know what? When then you compare what you see elsewhere and the passion that they have for making it happen and education is the answer. And then look at what we're doing in the US. Okay, by the way, one of the striking things the U.S. is one of the only, maybe the only, developed country on the planet that doesn't provide a BS level education for everyone. You know, we expect parents to pay for that. And now that um, the, the 2008 financial crisis is over, the states don't even subsidize it. That's where the tuition is going through the ceiling. How does this match up? By the way, those other countries like India have found a way to pay for a lot of it. Um, there's also AI. So that's our big invention. AI, this is gonna save everything. We'll just send everybody on a software program that will teach them how to be brilliant, okay? It, in fact, it'll know more than you do. So you just have to sit down, it recognizes who you are, it'll, it'll, have a, it'll tell you a story and it will see that you're doing things really well. How well is that going, okay? I'd suggest that you take a look at an article in the Atlantic Magazine in August of this year, it's co-authored by Henry Kissinger and by Dan Huttenlocher, who's the new dean of the uh, Schwarzman College of Computing at MIT, looking at AI. They have a slightly more troubled view of what AI is going to do. Don't think it's the answer to everything. It's a tool. It's not the answer. The problem with AI, very simply, it can solve complicated problems that we don't have any equations for. It has no explanation. It has no reason why this happens. It just knows if you watch this enough, this is what happens. There you go. There's your answer. Okay, that's not what it means to understand anything. To understand something means to make sense of it. 
And if it doesn't tell you how to make sense of it, it just enslaves you. Now what happens is you have to be extremely careful what you ask it to do, because it'll do exactly what you ask it to do, and the consequences of that will be disastrous. It has no wisdom, because it has no theory behind what's happening. Kind of an issue to worry about. So as we've been thinking about this at Olin, we've also discovered kids are different today than they were 20 years ago. Two years ago, this month, 2017, New York Times runs an article, there's an unprecedented epidemic of anxiety disorders among teenagers in America today. A month or two later, there's a spike in teenage suicides in America that's linked to the amount of time they spend in social media. Then, in January of, this, of 2018, Tim Cook is on live TV asking parents not to let their kids use their iPhone with software. Um, maybe there's something we don't understand about this that we need to look into. Mindset is really important. So the AI project, using AI to train people, works pretty well. It does not educate people because they don't make sense of things. Educating people has deeper roots than that. It's like the problem that we were talking about with education, being closer to what's wrong in a broken marriage than to you need a tool for your, for your uh, toolbox. How to fix it? Mindset, it turns out, is something that's deeply of interest in psychology today and has a profound interest on the long-term uh, outcomes for kids in their career. Here's the, the key. Very simple, back to the farm again. How do you, what's the takeaway message? Turns out, hopeful faculty members spread hope among their students. And cynical faculty members spread cynicism. You never met a cynical faculty member, have you? I did when I was a student. Luckily, I had one who was hopeful. And you all know him, he was Mel Ramey. He was my mentor who passed away from brain cancer about two years ago. Mel changed everything in my life because he helped build a growth mindset. Every time you walk into the classroom and you pick up a piece of chalk, you're not just teaching calculus, you're shaping a mindset. Whether you realize it or not, you're having an impact on that class. Somebody in that class has a broken heart, okay? And you better pay attention to that. And you're seeing what happens if you don't pay enough attention to it in what's going on at the school now. We need to be more tuned to what these kids are going through. There is a, a good news in all of this. If you look at the, the overall picture, it sounds really bad, okay? Never in my lifetime has there been a, a larger percentage of Americans who are absolutely fed up with higher education. The trust in leadership, have you heard about the admission scandal lately? Um, what do you think about that? Should we be subsidizing higher ed to to let the wealthy have better chances to get into colleges. What about this film, Starving the Beast, where people are in many states, six states, I can, Wisconsin, Virginia, Texas, North Carolina, Louisiana. This legislatures have forced the removal of the president of the flagship research university in each of those states in the last two years. And their concern is eliminate academic freedom. We've trusted you guys, you've broken the challenge, and now you're producing kids that can't do anything, they can't get a job, and um, they have a great amount of debt because you keep increasing the price. Starving the Beast is a movie which documents all this. The reason it's called that is their idea is very simple. We will cut off the funding for the state university and watch it implode. And when it goes away and the people leave, we'll rebuild it so that it's job training. That's the answer. I have not seen that in any of the 15 countries that I visited, but it's prominent in the US. So how can there be good news in this, Rick? Here's the good news. When change is needed, and the alternative is, I'm gonna work the rest of my life at McDonald's, maybe I'll think about a new way of doing education, because I have kids too. Um, it's pretty desperate in a number of places in higher ed, and I think the opportunity for change is real. It's never been this prominent in my lifetime. Not just engineering. We're talking about the 20 times larger group of students in liberal arts. And that brings me to the last bit of this little diatribe. Um, and it's a vision for the future. OK. So if I could close my eyes and I had a magic wand and I could paint, what is the solution to this? What do we need to do so that America leads again? I would say I would like to have an Olin outcome 
for all undergraduates in the US, all undergraduates, including the major state universities. Isn't that ridiculous? You couldn't possibly do it. Well, wait a minute. How do you get there? Let's think about this for a while. One of the things that Sally can probably tell you here is if you look at what happens to graduates everywhere, um, there is a, a linkage that has to happen between graduation day and placement day when you sign an employment letter for a company. Um, that transition is very different for people at Olin who majored in engineering than they are for people at, let's say, Southwest Louisiana University who majored in anthropology, okay? I'm going to be very unkind for a minute about the way we monitor these things and manage them and say, I will bet that there are zero companies that called up Southwest Louisiana State University, I'm not even sure there is one of those universities, and asked for a list of the graduates who are going to get a bachelor's degree in anthropology this year. Okay, I want, because I'm going to be there with my recruiter, those are the people whose skill sets I want to recruit. And it's not just anthropology, folks. It's a hard, long list of them. We had Howard Gardner in this auditorium in May who just did a seven-year study of higher education at Harvard. His original thought seven years ago in 2012 when they created the study was the future of the liberal arts. Did you know he had to change the name of it? Because he couldn't find anybody that knew what the liberal arts were. Okay? He gave up. It's, a, it's, it's not working. My bold Olin-esque answer do away with majors at the undergraduate level. What difference does it make? Um, the idea that you're going to become a miniature PhD in anthropology in four years and this is going to set your life forward is silly. Um, kids spend two years trying to figure out what an anthropologist is, okay? Reading in the encyclopedia, is this what I want to be? Um, I don't think that helps. What would you do instead? Okay, well, here's some ideas. And this is not going to work, so don't get excited folks, and I'm leaving so you don't have to put up with this for very much longer. Um, so here's what I would do. I would keep the foundation that we have, the basics in math and science that everybody takes no matter what their major is, and their fundamental exposure to humanities and social science. The, the program we have is robust and it works really well. It injects people back into the subject. It's integrated. There's no sharp divisions. I think that's all the right thing to do. And then I would simply remove the part of the educational curriculum that has a major title on it. Get rid of that. Um, you can pick that up later. Well, what would you do in the place of that? I would create a process of learning which is student-driven that includes four major elements. I'm going to overstate these for a shock effect and to make you think, all right? Only study those things that matter, things that matter to you, things that matter to society, things that matter to somebody you care about. You won't need to go to an encyclopedia to figure out what you're studying, okay? You'll know why you're doing it. Only study things in context. By the way, how did we get out of context? We did this because of academic disciplines. We had a group of specialists who only teach microeconomics, and so we take all the problems and we look at them through the lens of microeconomics and we come out with these theories that only work within the confines of some assumptions and by the way, if you're really good at this, you take the advanced course and you get even more out of context and we never bother to put it back into context before you graduate. We call them a PhD and then they're experts. Putting things in context is fundamentally important today. The context has never been more complicated. So why don't we just stay in context? I can tell you why they don't want to stay in context because it takes faculty from different disciplines in the room at the same time. You can't frame the problem if you have only electrical engineers in the room or only historians in the room. But if you have an electrical engineer and a historian in the room, it's not a lecture, it's meet the press. And now we have this debate about what's going on and people don't forget it, it's relevant and it has a meaning, okay? Learning things in context. And then learn things in teams. Always learn things in teams. I've never found a company yet who will tell you that what we do at this company is we put people in a cubicle by themselves with a multiple choice test and tell them not to talk to their neighbors, okay? People who do that really well, those are the ones that we promote. It's actually the ones who talk to their neighbors that you promote. This is the idea. Build 
the skill set of learning to build expertise around a really complex problem in context with people who are very different from you is golden. You will get a job if you can do that. I don't care what label you put on it. This is close to what Tom Friedman was talking about in San Francisco in 2014. Um, finally, and this is the most important part of it, it's about the purpose of all of these projects. The purpose for these projects in a liberal arts institution is primarily about what I think Mark has characterized at one point, and forgive me, Mark, maybe you don't want to be identified with this, um, problematizing the world. The idea is I do my job by studying the science really well and finding somebody to blame for what's wrong, and then dust my hands off and sit down. I've done my job, okay? What if you change that? What if instead of being an expert who can diagnose what other people should do, to a different paradigm, which says your purpose always in all of these projects is to imagine what has never been and do whatever it takes to make a positive impact on the world. Imagine if all of the millions of kids in America thought that being educated meant taking action to fix things when they're broken, like our kids are doing right now in the Frankly Speaking article. Okay, what if the whole country were doing that? This is a shift in paradigm. You might call it entrepreneurial mindset because they're imagining new things that are better. You could call it an engineering mindset because engineers make things that make things better. You could, I don't care what mindset you call it. The thing that would be different, of course, is that they're not necessarily getting an engineering label on their degree. I don't think it would matter. If you look at the placement of Olin graduates today, we have kids graduating in mechanical engineering who are going to Google to write code. Then they're not using those steam tables that you and I studied when we were kids, okay? How valuable was that to what they're doing? I don't doubt for a minute they could pick up the steam tables in graduate school if they had a reason to. The just-in-case knowledge about steam tables is not really useful. If you actually were to do something like this, and I believe back again in our friend um, Buckminster Fuller, somebody has to develop a real prototype that makes the others obsolete. You have to build one of these because nobody's going to believe it. I mean, Mark and I went to the, the um, Mellon Foundation. You know, it's like walking into the lion's den. This is the liberal arts um, community of the world. And we told them, we think liberal arts is obsolete. You know, you should do this. Um, we got out with our lives, uh, which was good. They were polite because they'd heard of Olin. Um, I wouldn't say they were convinced, all right? That's what we wanted to hear was what's wrong with this from their perspective. Somebody will have to build one. Somebody will have to make it. Just as inconvenient as Olin is for a lot of people, if you come here and look at it and you see the kids, they're completely different. Even MIT shakes its head and says, I think we need to do something differently. That's what it's going to take. Olin could do this, okay? This is the big idea. Olin could do this. How could you do it? Let me just blue sky. Suppose we we had the ability to increase our intake of students by 25 per year, that's it. These 25 would not be engineers. I don't know exactly what you call them yet, we have to have a design team to think of that. Um, they would study other things, which means that their projects would not be building a widget to do something. Their projects would be looking at things like poverty, or peace, or well-being, or equality, things that are more complicated in society. Those are the kinds of projects they would do, but they do them in the same way. So 25 kids per year, in four years that accumulates to 100 more students on campus. And then our graduation would have like one third mechanical engineers, one third electrical engineers, one third engineers, and one third these other things, whatever we call them, okay? I'm gonna say that Olin faculty, if you gave them five years to do this, and the freedom to experiment, they would figure it out. And I think the Olin faculty would do better than the faculty at Harvard or Stanford or anywhere else on the planet because this is what we do at Olin, is we experiment with learning and we understand what kids need. At the end of that five-year period, Olin would have graduates who think differently than the undergraduates at any other institution. And I think probably because it's Olin, employers would come anyway. Because, well, you know, there's a bunch of engineers there. It's probably worth the flight. They would be impressed that they couldn't tell the difference between the kids who had this new major and the old major, and they'd all get jobs, okay? And then if we got enough attention and we were really fortunate, this could wind up being Olin 2.0. Um, just an idea. Okay, but what would it cost? 
Well, I don't know, but if you had, if you could run the whole thing with um, one check, an endowment rather than year by year, it's probably in the 50 to $75 million range. You have to build a building, you have to buy, you have to get some new faculty, and so forth. There is some tuition that you get, not enough to su support it. And if it were wildly successful, so that 10 years from now, uh, this became just like the engineering program in all of the national and international rankings of undergraduate education, Olin is at the top, and everybody's coming here to see it. Then we think about parcel B, okay? What about building an entirely new Olin, an Olin College of Liberal Arts? Okay, that has Mike Moody's old philosophy here. He says, what's wrong with liberal arts is that we've lost our way in, in requiring rigor in math and science in liberal arts. The rest of it's fine, um, but we don't have those math teachers. I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for my math teacher in high school, Miss Walters. I had her all four years, okay? There was only one math class in this high school and we had the same teacher. Miss um, Walters wouldn't be there today because we fixed the problem of having no opportunities for women. When she grew up, she had a small menu. You could be a nurse, you could be a secretary, you could be a teacher. Today, she could be an astronaut. I mean, we need them how has a elementary school named for a Needhamite who's a woman astronaut. She could be a CEO of Google. She could be a CEO of Verizon. She could be anywhere, okay? She probably wouldn't choose to be a math teacher at Tranquility High School, 40 miles from the nearest hospital out in the farmland. Um, and that's happened all over the country. We fixed that. Women now have options, but we didn't backfill the consequences. We don't have math teachers now in a lot of these countries. Something over 90% of the kids who learn math and science in the fifth grade in this country are taught by teachers who do not have a degree in math and science. Um, that's why when they get to college, you have an option. This is like the valedictorian of a famous high school in, in New York showing up at Princeton, they're not prepared in the same way in math and science that they were a generation ago. What's Princeton gonna do? Tell them you guys are, well, I guess you'll have to stay five years to get the same education. No, what do they do? They create new math and science courses for non-majors, okay? There is a math for dummies. There is a physics for politicians. There isn't a poetry for dummies. There isn't a history course for engineers. They take the same courses. The new liberal arts college at Olin would fix that. They'd all come out with the same foundation. Even if you had more of a history bent, you would know how to calculate. You would know how to understand what the planets do when they were rotating around the sun. Very different. Okay, I'm not sure if you're still awake, but it's five o'clock. I'm gonna stop at this point, and if you do wanna ask questions, I would be glad to answer them for a few minutes. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, I, I really appreciated the, like the thousands of nuggets of wisdom you just downloaded. And I ask you about transformation. You said it, uh, that we can't teach if we haven't the lived experience. And how are we, you talked about transformation being identity change. This is totally threatening. You talked about the faculty being critical to this. You're, uh, and clearly there is no absence of a compelling reason, if we listen to Greta Thunberg, for us to be doing, to be learning. So how are the faculty going to be safe enough to go through this identity change that you're talking about? Yeah, really good question. I'm not sure I heard every word because the acoustics in the front of the room are not the same as they are in the back. Nevertheless, I'll answer what I think you said, okay? And, and that's, how are these faculty going to transform people? How, I mean, how do you... Okay. Okay. That, yeah. So that they can be functional yeah. teachers. Yeah, that's, that's a form of what I'm trying to say here. How can they be safe enough to take on this task to begin with? That's really, that's exactly, by the way, what I'm doing right now with the Kern Foundation and the Coalition for Life Transforming Education. I don't know the formula, but we're learning more every day. One of the things I know for sure, the safe enough question is exactly the right question. If you there are faculty doing this right now in a lot of these camp campuses, but they're keeping their head down, right? Not safe enough. 
they need to talk to the president and the provost. They need to embrace this idea as being foundational to what the mission of the university is in the 21st century. Make it okay. Turns out presidents and provosts can't make things happen. I guarantee that. I am one, okay? I haven't done anything. It's our faculty that did it. But they can sure stop it. They can stop it without even knowing they're stopping it. So the first thing you have to do is get green lights at the top so these people don't get cut off at the knees when they're trying to work on the right problems. Um, we're making some pretty good progress. You know, so two years ago, I, with some wind at my back from the Kern Foundation, who were just as crazy as I am, we, we decided we'll try to build a network, a small network of universities who are willing to experiment in this area. They need to be large enough, like public universities, that it could make an impact if it actually worked. So how many do you need? We're patterning this after what's happening in medical education, which is also being reinvented right now, go to medednext.com and you'll see, or .edu. Um, we need about six. Okay, would they even respond to me? I mean, if you're gonna write to, for example, the president of the University of Texas at Austin, and he gets this inbox from the guy who does what? He leads a college with 350 students and all they study is engineering, and they don't even have a PhD program? Okay, I'm gonna hedge my bets. I'm gonna write to 12. Maybe six of them will answer. Do you know what happened? All 12 answered, and they all wanted to come. There's much more interest in this than you think. Now our problem is weeding it, okay? Now we have more universities that want to come. Talk, talking with Anna Marie Couchy at the University of Washington, Seattle, is very interested in this. Um, Dave Williams at Ohio State University believes that their provost and president is on board. And Ohio State has 50,000 students, okay? Um, Mitch Daniels at Purdue, who is the one who funded the, the Gallup-Purdue Index, is really interested in it. So maybe we can get them to endorse the idea and make it okay for the faculty members who are doing it. That's the first idea, okay? Um, the next thing is, okay, so you get green lights from the president. What's gonna happen now? So we have many grants programs, and with help from Lauren, for example, who had a brilliant idea of taking the current money we have there and making little grants, figuring that the real value of grant opportunity is not the dollars, it's the time you spend writing the proposal. You meet new people, you, the, the genie comes out of the bottle, now you really have a belief in this, and now you wanna do it, even if you don't get the money. So let's start with giving them a reason to sit in the same room and develop a vision for what they could do. And we're now creating a grants program for all of these dozen universities. We're gonna meet on December 10th at Chicago Airport. We have some exemplars of universities that are doing it. Um, our guest speaker this time is Clayton Spencer, who is the president of Bates College. Why are we inviting her? In seven years, she's developed a project there called Purposeful Work, okay? Purposeful Work. Every graduate liberal arts college is now at Bates is going into a job that they have not postponed thinking about until 20 minutes before they got their diploma. They've been thinking about this for four years. They've been aiming themselves. They've had, they've had internships. Even if you're an English major at Bates, you have an internship. You also have recent graduates within the last two or three years come back to the campus. They're folded into the courses to tell their classmates, this is what I experienced when I left you know, Bates and I wanted to be a, a writer at the New York Times. I went down there and I spent the summer there and this is what I found out they're looking for. Um, and the alumni also told Bates, tell your faculty to be more realistic, okay? You're setting expectations that these kids are gonna change the world in 20 minutes after they graduate. They find out that the company thinks it's nice to change the world, but they actually have to make money. I and mean, somehow that has to be figured in to what it means to be a successful Bates graduate. In seven years, the Gallup data shows, a sample of 2,000, Bates graduates are an order of magnitude, 10 times higher on the well-being index than the graduates of other liberal arts colleges in America. And what she's doing is completely scalable. You could do that at Ohio State, okay? Yes, the president would have to change their fundraising. They'd have to ask money for money for internships for English majors, not just engineers. Um, they didn't have too much trouble getting it to done at Bates. I'll bet you could do it there too, if it were a priority. Um, so we don't know how to do it. We're experimenting. 
I think something big is going to happen in the U.S. in this area because the unhappiness with what we're doing now has never been this high. Anybody else? Like I'm standing between you and dinner, so. Just a quick one. First one is, will you share your notes? Well, yeah, it's, I'm not sure you'll be able to make sense of it. The, the, yeah, it's a long talk. It's not a short question. Um, I will just say this. Tenure is not the boogeyman we think it is. Tenure, I know just as many creative people at universities who have tenure as I know people who don't. But there's something underlying tenure that is a problem, which is peer review, okay? And that's a long discussion. Um, peer review tends to be a very regressive kind of metric because it makes all of the faculty members subject to the secret opinions of other faculty members about the, the credibility of what they're doing. It can be the most powerful tool, tool for creating innovation when it's done right, and I think Olin does a, a really good job, but just eliminating tenure at Ohio State, for example, would not necessarily result in creativity. In fact, if you look at the statistics, Ralph, the percentage of faculty members today that are tenured anywhere in America is much lower than they were 10 years ago. Universities are doing away with tenure now. I just got back from the University of Connecticut two weeks ago. Turns out that they, they, they call them, they're not, it's something like visiting professors. These are non-tenured professors that have all the credentials of the regular tenured faculty. They're folded into the departments in the same way. They teach the same courses. They supervise classes. They just don't have tenure. Um, and I asked them, will all departments uh, accept this? No, they're in the process. Some departments accept them exactly the same as everyone else. Other departments have this sort of arm's length thing. Um, I think the institution of tenure is not growing, it's shrinking in America, whether we recognize it and talk about it or not. Um, and if you did away with it today, it wouldn't be the shocking change that you think. But you could have create a huge culture change if you really address the issue of peer review and how peer review works. And even more fundamental, besides peer review, is what our faculty did here at Olin, redevelop or rethink the whole contract of what successful faculty behavior means. It's not about teaching, research, and service at Olin. Those are three independent buckets. It's a Venn diagram, and they intersect. So instead of teaching, it's building student, student success. Instead of research, I think it's nationally visible achievement. Okay? Instead of service, it's building the institutional success. Um, and our folks are doing a wonderful job of pioneering this new way of thinking about success, and that could spread to any university, even if they had tenure. I think it would transform what they're doing. Aren't you guys hungry? Any more questions? Okay, thank you. <laughs>